speakers that uh, that make this whole thing worthwhile. And that's why I really volunteered to do all this effort and getting all these things working. Is I'm really excited to hear what Scott has to say, as well as everybody we have uh, coming up. Yes. So, thank Scott. you. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Thanks for coming. Uh, let's start out by saying a few things about who I am and what I do. Uh, I have done 35 races to Hawaii. I've done at least 20 transpats. Actually, I revised that to 19 and a half. Yeah. Because in the last transpat, not last year, but three years prior to that, there was a boat that had a very unfortunate accident right in front of us and they sank. And we ended up picking up the entire crew and sent them coming back to California. So we didn't make it to Hawaii. So it's 19 and a half. And then I've done at least 15 pack cups. I really have lost count on how many I've done. And so I've done, I think I've experienced just about everything out there that, that can be experienced, including dismasting a few years back in the pack cup. And we were about 70 miles out when the mast fell down. And so if that's going to happen, you're either going to want to do it really, really early or really, really late. <laughs> you don't want to do it in the middle. So we did it 70 miles out, and that was pretty good because we were back the next morning. But I've spent uh, my career, I started in a boatyard at my uncle's boatyard in Sausalito. Didn't like that. Went into the sail making business. Love that. And then started my own rigging business when I was in college. And I've been doing that for since I was 20. And um, I was the starboard side trimmer on the America's Cup boat here when we went to Perth, Australia. I've uh, been a two time member on the America or on the Admiral's Cup team. Uh, 17 world championships, all this other stuff. So I feel like I'm really qualified today to talk to you about what it is that you're going to experience out there. And most importantly, how to avoid, <clears throat> excuse me, how to avoid kind of catastrophes in the night. And I think almost everybody who's done an ocean race like this can tell you that it's the work that you do prior to the start that will increase your enjoyment. You'll sleep better out there if you know you've done your homework, if you've done your due diligence with the boat, and you can really have a wonderful time sailing to Hawaii. Um, there's a movie called Captain Ron, which is really funny. And he has a piece of philosophy in there that I think is, is uh, you know, it still cracks me up to this day. My, there it is. <laughs> yeah, the only way you can find out if you're truly ready is to get out there, because if it's going to happen, it's going to happen out there. And from experience, it's going to happen between dusk and dawn. <laughs> I don't know why that is, but it's just the case. So one of the things that we encourage is that you pull the rigs. I'm sorry, it happens all the time on the East Coast. They pull their rigs every year because the boats get put away. Out here in California, we tend to sail our boats all the time, 12 months a year. And the boats are kind of neglected because the weather's so beautiful. Rather than pulling the boat down, taking it apart, we want to go out and sail on a beautiful day like today. There are things that you cannot see if you inspect the mast when the mast is up. So we, I mean, I'm the, I know I'm the bearer of bad news, but I live in this really strange world where my mother hated guns growing up and she would never allow us to have them. She went to work for the police department in Marin County. About a year after working for the police department, she came home one day and said, I think I'm gonna get a gun. When you surround yourself with bad stuff all the time and that's all you're exposed to, it affects your reality. And my reality is every Monday morning, we get the phone call where my rig fell down or this broke or that broke. I'm constantly bombarded by things that happen to masts and booms and boats. And so it does affect my reality. So I've got to tell you that if you're gonna spend this much time and energy to get your boat safely to Hawaii, that the rig should be pulled down take it apart and then put back together properly. If your standing rigging is older than 10 to 12 years, 
10 years for wire, 12 years for rod, it should be replaced. And the insurance companies are getting very, very difficult to deal with. And they're usually requiring you to have a rigging survey done. And we do take the mass apart. And if they find out that your stuff is older than the industry standard, we didn't come up with it. This is just what we've been told that they'll make you replace your stuff. We send a report to the, to you and you forward it on the insurance company and then they'll reinsure you. They're getting tougher and tougher to deal with. And so this is the new reality. But again, if you do that, you're going to sleep better at night knowing that everything that's, that's up is, is safe and it's been inspected and it's been properly inspected and properly reassembled. We as riggers have to have to put you together or our customers, we have to put you together like this is going to be the worst year ever in the pack cup. That's the only way I can sleep at night too, because doing 35 races to Hawaii, I've seen some pretty horrendous uh, conditions out there. And, you know, a lot of people try to get away with things and go, well, it's going to be fine. Or this is like, no, 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 that's not the way we do that. You can go to somebody else and maybe they'll tell you that it'll be fine. I've seen too much. And I want to see everybody in here get to Hawaii and be safe and happy and be friends with each other and, and not have things clamped together with bailing wire and, and uh, Dyneema and things like that to keep the boat going. You want to get there and have your boat in great shape. So I would highly encourage you to pull the rig out of the boat, lay it down, take it apart, put it back together. Again, this is just qualifies me to see a lot of, you know, pretty horrific stuff in my career. So now this picture here is of a mass that we pulled out recently that had a huge kink in it right at the deck and it had this rubber boot over it. We could not have seen this unless we pulled the rig out of the boat. This thing was going to fall down at any time, but it looked perfect in the boat. And this is one of those areas that you must check and you must have the mass properly secured at the deck. A lot of people use wedges. Some people use wood wedges, which we think are horrible. But again, days and days of rocking back and forth in the ocean on the way to paradise, wedges can fall out. So yes, we think that Spartite is a good project, uh, product. We're trying to also eliminate noises, squeaking. Wedges falling out, the mass banging around in the partners. We're trying to eliminate all these problem areas. And the biggest problem areas for you are the top of the mast, where all the halyards go, the boom vang fitting at the deck on the mast, the gooseneck fitting for the boom itself. And uh, those are the real hot spots. And then, of course, the end of the spinnaker pole or the spinnaker pole car on the mast. These are the places we spec spend extra emphasis on to make sure that it's not only built properly, but oftentimes we step things up a size because you're gonna put a lot of days, hours on your way to Hawaii. And these are the parts that are loaded. You know, a spinnaker pole car when you're square back is trying to rip itself off the front of the mass and it oftentimes succeeds. And when that happens, and that's, again, that'll happen about 2.30 in the morning, blowing probably 20, 25, and uh, probably moonless. So, uh, yeah, just add it all up. It's, it's not, a, not a good situation. But again, this is something that we could not have seen until we pulled the mask out. That's the top of a mast of a boat where the halyards weren't constructed properly, where there wasn't a ball, a big plastic ball underneath the shackle. So the shackle got driven into the top of the mast and dented everything up, and then it take the carbon fiber up. This is a spot that you really have to pay attention to, whether you have blocks hanging externally from the top of the mast, or whether this is a tri halyard system where the spinnaker halyards go into the mast this way. All the halyards that we build, we call it offshore spec. All of our halyards will have a spectra chafe cover over the halyards at the top to protect against things like this. But when we took a mast out like this, we would take all this apart, pound out the dents, and polish everything up so it just looks beautiful and it's completely smooth and the rollers are rolling and the cotter pins are protected. These are the things that you will do to make sure you don't have a problem. And this is a properly constructed 
um, crane. This is underneath the mast where the main halyard goes up into the spar. One of the things that you'll have here is you'll have days on end of the headboard swinging off to the side. And when the headboard swings off to the side, the main halyard goes into the top of the mast at a very acute angle, and that will cause chafe. And it's not something that you may notice sailing around the bay because you're not downwind for very long. But when you go to pack up, you're going to be days on end going downwind, jiving back and forth occasionally. And that will become a problem. It'll be one of those things like we never had this problem before. Why are we having a problem now? And unfortunately, it's happening up there, which is hard to see. And that's why we, we can talk later about how many times you should go aloft to check things during the race or at least have a pair of binoculars that you can look up there and see what's going on. All right, so these are, these are two more hot spots that we were talking about, and they need some attention. So then we're talking about rigging. What do you bring? How many lines do you bring? Whether you're racing or whether you're cruising, your performance will drop if you carry too much stuff that you don't need. When if you can, you bring as much new stuff as you can in the way of sheets and guys and halyards. If it's new and if it's properly constructed, you don't need to take extra stuff. And when, you, when we build a set of offshore rigging for a boat, we also include a list with the stuff that we built, what things become other things. Like if you were to damage an after guy at the spinnaker pole, well, the jib sheet is now the new after guy. It's constructed in a way that you can use it for the after guy. A spinnaker sheet is long enough to be an extra halyard. If you were to eat through a halyard, then you can use one of your spare spinnaker sheets. Most people we bring four so that we can, we always know what we can use for an additional, for additional purposing. So we're not bringing extras of things. And again, whether it's, uh, whether you're racing or whether you're cruising, if it's not performance that you're really worried about, you should be worried about space, just carrying too much stuff on the boat. And a boat that is lighter than a heavy boat is an easier boat to sail. It's easier to drive, it heals less, it rocks less, it pitches less in, in seas for the first few days trying to go to weather. So we construct things like a spinnaker sheet has got uh, chafe pieces on both ends. So if it's starting to chafe at the winch, you can change that thing out. You can turn it around, plug it back in so that the area of chafe is, is located in another spot. So you can then go again. Our background with the, with the Pi Wacket, this is the Disney program. I've been with them for 25 years. I've done all the rigging for the 100 footer. And now we have both a 68 footer and a, and a Volvo 70 that's extremely turbo. <laughs> We make sure that we're not bringing too much stuff, but we always have to make sure that we're ready for something kind of unforeseen because dropping out of a race after spending sometimes millions of dollars to do a race is out of the question. So I have a lot of responsibility to make sure that we finish. And to do that, I have to make sure that we always have what we need if there's a, if there's a problem. So we, we make things double duty. And we put ends on, we put ends or shackles on both on both ends of things. Soft shackles are a wonderful product, and so uh, don't be afraid to use properly constructed soft shackles to connect to the spinnaker clues, the tacks of the spinnakers. Um, offshore, it's really good. They're slow, so it's not great for buoy racing. But soft shackles are actually very good offshore, and you can have a bunch of them on board in a bag or hanging in the cockpit so you can get to them quickly. And uh, they don't weigh much, they don't take up much room and they don't bang the, bang the boat up either. So it's a, it's a pretty good product for that. And again, these are, these are the spots where I think most people, if you don't have a rudder problem, you're gonna have a problem here, which is the boom bang fitting. And it may look perfectly fine, but if there's a gap in here, and then the boom is constantly going bang, 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 bang while you're sailing. The guys down below, you can't sleep. So you're trying to make the boat as quiet as possible. So all these vertical pins here, the pin that goes through there, everything should have a product called Tef gel on it. It's uh, 
it's a tough long grease. You can get it in a little syringe. And that's what you want to do to stop the squeaking of things. And again, there should be some you know, bushings in here. And that, these things should be as tight as possible without the, without the lug banging around. And then this is the boom bang fitting. Look at the boom so carefully that you have in this area here. You're looking for cracks, crazing. There will be corrosion most likely because of the dissimilar metals like the stainless steel bolts going into the boom. Again, this is... It's such an important area. So bang lug, this lug here, and then the partners, how is the mass secured in the boat at the deck? And if you can get a product like Spartite in there, it's better than individual wedges. Obviously, if you're stepped on deck, none of this stuff matters to you and that's just fine. But if you do have a mass, it's stepped down below. Um, you've got to make sure that it's dry here too. You don't want water down below. Spartite is not what we'd call a waterproof thing, but it certainly does help. But, but spend, spend some time and attention at this area here so you don't have this mass banging around inside there as the wedges fall out. We see this all the time. And a lot of people still use wooden wedges, which are hard. And the Spartite is a rubber material. So uh, we actually see wooden wedges do damage to the spars in this area here because the mass gets momentum and it starts to dead the mass. So get rid of wooden wedges. You can use rubber or a spark type product is really good. Any questions so far? Yes. How often would you inspect the rigging? Mm. <clears throat> well, uh, once a year for sure. Uh, but nobody does that. You know, we always inspect it when it's laying on the deck and they go, oh. Uh, yeah, we, we haven't had a look at that for a while. It's something completely serviceable and, and something we could have saved. Uh, the rat rig fell down. So, uh, And while it's kind of off subject, it's, it's Hall Spars, which was got a, a super company and they built a great product. They're no longer in business. And if your rig falls down nowadays, Mr. Ballinger is having a terrible time getting aluminum extrusions nowadays. And your carbon fiber uh, mass manufacturers, there's only one or two in America nowadays. And mm, I'd rather have a Hulse you know, It's just, you don't have a lot of great options right now. So take care of your masks. You don't want to have to replace them at this point. It's not a good time. Yes, sir. Do you have any concern about uh, soft shackles wearing through? No, not a properly constructed one. Plus they're usually so much stronger than, uh, than they're rated for. So there's a lot of extra material there. And so we go for days without any problem with those things. And we, and we put them through the ringer, believe me. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> it all depends on the turnbuckles. The question is, do you do cotter pins or, or, you know, what do you do? Uh, if the turnbuckle is highly exposed, we do not like bo uh, boots over things. We like to be able to inspect. What we do personally is we cap the uh, turnbuckle and we put in a socket head screw. So it does not require tape uh, and it's easy to back out. And we always give people extra ones, but we, we cotter pins are highly effective. But they can do a tremendous amount of damage to people and sales. And I kind of hate tape. I just think it's a bad look. Sometimes you can't. That's fine too, but that's a two, that's a two tool thing. And we always think about how to do something with only one tool or no tools. Uh, because if you ever come up on deck in bad conditions, you have to do something. You don't want to have to search for two tools and then you don't want to have to try to control or not lose two tools. Yes, sir. Can you, can you repeat your comments about carbon versus aluminum? Yeah, oh, that's an easy one. Carbon is great. Aluminum is cheap. <laughs> um, uh, and let, let me say this too. I don't know if, how many boats, you know, these, what, you, what you're going on. That's why I wanted to take questions so I can kind of tailor it to a, your more specific boats. We see Beneteau, Genoves. We see these boats that are sailing around the bay that were really designed for someplace else. And consequently, I've made a nice career out of replacing booms in mass furling uh, 
cast aluminum gooseneck fittings and boom vang fittings. And we, we do this all the time. And we take them out, we throw them away if they're not broken already, because they're going to break soon. And we replace them with stainless steel gooseneck fittings that wrap around the mast that are uh, bolted in. And we actually through bolt these things. And the way we do that is we drill a one inch hole under the spinnaker pole track. We lift the track off, we drill a hole under that, and we reach inside with nuts welded on welding rods. And we reach inside and then we actually through bolt the gooseneck fittings. And um, we don't worry too much about the people in the future that have to get it off. We're just going to make sure that it's not going to come off on our watch. And so uh, that's another thing that it's just uh, a Gar, Gar Howard uh, is a very, very good company when it comes to sending them a pattern of your mask. They make these things for a price. I don't know how they do it, but they fit perfectly. Uh, again, I, I have high marks for the Gar Howard company and what they're able to do in order to strengthen up that part of the mast. So, uh, and then as far as carbon, yes, carbon masts are absolutely wonderful. Any boat that has an aluminum mast now, if you throw a properly built carbon mast into it, it's gonna sail better. You'll have better head stay tension, mainsail shape, all the stuff that comes with a stiffer, lighter mast you're gonna have. And uh, I, I won't even get into the sail making part of it, but there are some big advantages to a carbon mast also when it comes to sail making, sail shapes, things like that. So, and they can take a lot of abuse. They're much stronger than an aluminum mast. Yes, sir. The nut that you're welding onto the end of a rod, how are you making sure that doesn't come off? Loctite. Green? Red. 263. Um, we just went round and round with the Loctite company because we had some rigging that was supplied to us where it came apart, even though it had red Loctite on it. It literally, you could take your finger and take it apart. So we called the Loctite company. We said, we got a problem. And so we use a, now it's called 263, not 277, not 275, 263 is the stuff that you use. And there is a primer for it that you don't need. But anyway, yeah, we actually saw some pretty shocking stuff and we had a backstay from the J105 just drop out of the air, even though it was completely covered in red Loctite. And so uh, we kind of went all in on this to find out what the problem was and we did solve the problem, so. Um, that's a good point is uh, Loctite. Things will want to come apart out there. Some things want Loctite, some things want silicone, some things want um, a product called Duralac. There are some things that you don't want to back out easily. So a product like Tef Gel is not correct for spinnaker pole track fasteners. That's a Loctite product. So some things you want to be able to get apart easily and they're not loaded and that's fine. And it's some things you wanna lock them down so that they cannot come undone because the constant loading and unloading of spinner to pull cars, uh, sheet blocks, things like this, where the constant pressure is on and off, on and off, will back stuff out that you will not believe could ever come apart, but it does. And that's why when you have uh, spinnaker blocks, things like that, if you can get a zip tie through the, through the shackle pin, Put a zip tie through there. And if you put a colored one in, you can see that it's there and you can maybe see that if it's missing, but every shackle around the base of the mast, every shackle on the running backs, whatever it is, should have some Loctite on it or a zip tie or something to keep it from coming undone. It is amazing what pressure of on and off, on and off will back stuff out and things come apart. It's, uh, 2 a.m., 2.30 maybe. <laughs> Any more questions? Again, this is this is the stuff that we, this is the pie wacket 68. We have two pie wackets, one's 70 feet, this one's 68. This is all we brought for, uh, this is a combo race. Again, uh, chafe covers, on things like after guys, spinnaker poles, people, you've got to inspect the tip of the spinnaker pole. There's going to be days of chafe out there. And so that has to be constructed properly. Take them apart, buff them. Uh, it's very popular for the trip line to come undone from the end of the pole on the inside. You've got to take the poles completely apart. 
lock tight any kind of shackle that's on the inside, make sure the spring is working perfectly. Uh, that's going to get a lot of use. And so uh, some of you may carry two spinnaker poles, and that's a personal preference thing. Um, I don't really have an opinion on that if you have one good pole. Uh, if, if your boat is fast and you're always reaching, then I wouldn't carry two poles. People usually break a pole when they're on a boat that's pretty slow and they're, they're squared back all the way. And then the boat starts to oscillate downwind because you're sailing so slow and you lose it to lure and you stuff the pole. Somebody lets the fore guy off and wraps it around the forward lower and you break the pole. If you carry one pole, carry a repair kit. Uh, if it's aluminum, you can get a sleeve. You cut the pole, you put the sleeve in. It's a pretty easy thing to do. Um, but again, if fast boats like this, one pole, slow boats, you may want to have two poles just in case somebody does lose it at 2.30 in the morning and stuff it and break the pole. Anybody have carbon poles versus aluminum poles, things like that? Um, there's a product, it's called Sticky Back. Everybody has it in the sail making industry. We have fluorescent Sticky Back that we put on all of our halyards. So we know when the halyard's up all the way. Because one of the mistakes that gets made is that people will wind the halyards too far up and into the top of the mast. And then you have a chafe problem, then you damage the top of the mast like we saw in that previous shot. And so we wrap uh, about six inches wide of fluorescent Sticky Back around the halyard just after the clutch usually, so that the people that are in the pit know when the halyards are up, but not up too far, not down too far. So you can see these things. So many of the things that we do are uh, to set things up prior to the maneuver. We have all the halyards marked for reefing. We have the reef lines marked, so we know how far to bring those in, how far the halyards come down. All these things pre-marked so that so you don't have a mistake and you can get the maneuver done as quickly as possible. And I think it's important also in our program that the same people always do the same job. So if it's time to reef, the pit person comes up and does that job. So there isn't a mistake made there. Same person grinds the reef out, haul out. Same person's on the main sheet, things like that. So that it can get done properly, quickly without damaging the boat in the process. And then, uh, so again, the halyard balls on all the, to protect all the halyards from, from grinding the stainless steel into the top shivs or into the top of the mast. And then the max halyard marks we think are just critical also. Anything, even a, even a sharpie. It's just hard to see a sharpie at night, but it's easy to see the, the day glow sticky back. So um, when you're out there and you're going uh, in the morning, Walk around the boat, make sure everything is still tight. Make sure those zip ties are still in place. Make sure there's no pins laying on the deck, cotter or clevis. Uh, you can spot so much stuff if you walk the boat in the morning. And then evening checks too. That's, uh, again, that's what I do. That's my job, but we're all very aware of what we're looking for, but have a walk around the boat. And it's, uh, and I'm, while I'm specifically into the rig, obviously somebody climbing down below to take a look at the steering system, things like that. Just have a look when you can, when the sun is up, have a look to make sure everything's doing fine. Again, Tef gel, cotter pin, millionaire's tape. Everybody know what millionaire's tape is? Okay, millionaire's tape is an extruded, there's two kinds, there's skived and extruded. It's Teflon tape and it's really, really good for chafe reduction. We put it on spreader tips. We put it on any line that crosses another line. We put it on lifelines where the spinnaker sheet may be touching that. You can get it at West Marine. And, um, and it's called Millionaire's Tape because a little roll of it costs about 50 bucks. And uh, uh, you should have some of that on board. You can't have too much white electrical tape. You can't have too many rolls of, of Millionaire's Tape. And that will solve a lot of problems because there will be chafe issues and you're just gonna to wanna to take care of that. And you can even wrap the after guy where it goes through the spinnaker pole, anything like that, just burn it up, put it out there. It'll help a lot. Uh, so you should have, you should have that white electrical and, uh, 
the millionaire's tale. I've got plastics. We're finishing in the daytime, which is <laughs> yeah. Who does that? It's not a real race. Yeah. Yeah. This year we finished the trans pack at uh, two thirty in the morning, and uh, which is kind of normal, so all the families have to come down and get out of bed. And then the owner, Roy, he really wanted some photos of the boat, so he said, "Okay." Guys, we got to get out of bed. We're going to go back out in the sunshine. <laughs> That's very unpopular. <laughs> so, Sharon Green came out and we did a little photo session out there. You also uh, took a bunch of youth out, too, which was great. Yeah, I think we did. I don't know, did we? Uh, yeah, but we don't. Uh, this boat is not something we take the, uh, the uninitiated out for. It's not a fun boat that way because you can get, get hurt pretty badly. So again, um, what I'd like to offer everybody here, since everybody's boat is different, I'd like to offer uh, just an hour of my time to either meet with you on your boat or a telephone conference or email, whatever it may be, just a consultation, whatever your issues may be. Again, everybody's boat is so different that it's hard for me to, it's, it's, I'm so general when it comes to talking about these things. But please give me a call, send me an email, I have cards, and if there's anything I can answer for you, and if your boat is local, I'd be more than happy to swing by and take a look at the boat and see if there's anything I can do to spot something that may be problematic, that looks fine at the dock, but that's not fine in the middle of the ocean. So any more questions? Yes? Can you talk a little bit about some of the issues we see with people that buy new boats or buy a brand new boat? Say, well, I just bought this boat yeah. Uh, oh, thank you, Ben. That's a loaded one. Uh, uh, so many of the boats that we see, again, are engineered for someplace else. San Francisco Bay is a wonderful place to be a rigging company. Uh, <laughs> um, and so we don't act, we, we can go mention something to somebody and they'll go, yeah, that, no, that's going to be fine. We don't trust you. We don't believe you, whatever it is. And that out there will prove them wrong and prove us right. And so the coast of California is a world-class nasty place on the wrong day. Going to the Farallons, I've been to Fastnet Rock. I've been to Hobart. I've been to these, I've done these things where it's like, oh my God, that was incredible, incredibly bad. And so, uh, so we have these boats here that are designed and engineered for someplace else, whether it's San Diego or Long Island Sound. And while the boats look great and they worked great on sea trial, when it's time for them to really get after it somewhere in the ocean, will the boat perform? Will the in mass fairly jam? And yes, it will. Uh, and, and so. And the owners, I get it. They're very disappointed because they thought that they got a boat that was ready to go do these things, and it just is not. It would be for San Diego, but it is not for San Francisco, and it's not going to be great for a trip to Hawaii without having a problem. So we are very, very good at spotting these things and saying, yeah, that's not going to be right. And it's very disappointing for an owner who just bought this very nice boat to hear that what they bought is insufficient for what they want to do. So we, again, are the bearer of bad news. And I say, well, go get a second opinion because my life experience is different than some other rigging companies around here where they have not been in the North Atlantic or the Southern Ocean like I have and seen what, what mother nature can bring. And so my solution to some of these problems and some of these boats that we look at can be shocking to, to these owners and we get that but we have to sleep at night too potentially for you guys to sail to hawaii i want that to be the greatest experience of your life because it can be but it isn't it can be a complete nightmare if the boat isn't the boat and the crew isn't prepared for what might happen out there but man it is great when you guys get out there the poles back and the boat is rolling down these beautifully long swells and you know that in a few days you're going to be seeing this magnificent island pop up. Uh, it still amazes me that the navigators find this little island in the middle of nowhere. Um, but it is, it's a fantastic experience and I'm excited for everybody who's going to be doing this. But just be prepared. Yes, sir. 
Yes, sticky back. Yes. It will, yeah, because we stitch it on. We'll, yeah, we wrap it around really tightly when the line is tight, so it's small, and then we'll stitch it. And if you, if we build you a halyard, we actually run it through a straight stitch machine, so that it's locked in place and doesn't go anywhere. Yeah. Yes. You had made a comment earlier about you, you need to go up the mast during the race. Right. Uh, here's my. If you have taken the mast out just before the race and everything has been gone through and you know the chafe gear is good and all the shackles have been replaced that hang the spinnaker blocks at the top, going aloft is can be kind of a dangerous thing and we would say don't do it. But if, if you haven't inspected things recently, we think that you should go up there and there are safe ways to do it, which I, I could talk about that too. Um, but there are times when you don't do it, whether you, you, if it's rolling back and forth and somebody can get hurt, if they lose grip on the boat when it's rocking back and forth, don't do that. Don't, don't risk somebody's injury. I mean, sometimes we actually, we have to go up there and our guys will put on a life jacket just to absorb the shock. Because when you're at the top of 140 foot mass and it's doing this, it's everything those guys can do to hold on. And if they are ever to lose grip, they just get the, the Jesus beat out of them. So, you, you don't go up there unless you have to. And most of these boats that I think you guys have, you can lay on the deck with a pair of binoculars and have a pretty good look at what's going on up there. What, and, you, what, what, are, what are signs you're looking for? Oh, uh, you're looking for chafe issues with halyards. Yeah. Um, uh, you're just looking for mainsail luff slides that don't look right, uh, halyard pins, or you know, you're, just, you're just looking for everything. You just start at the bottom and work your way up, trying to find a, a potential problem. But uh, Again, it's not safe to go up, uh, but sometimes you have to. And if the weather's nice, it's a great time for some photographs on the top of the race. Yeah, that's a, some pretty spectacular stuff. Yes, sir. Locking halyards. Locking halyards. Yeah. Yeah. For ocean racing, we wouldn't. We wouldn't. Uh, you know, if the lock goes bad and you can't get a sail down, that's not a good idea. Most. Most ocean going boats don't have locking halyards. Piwak it has all locking halyards, but those systems are those cassettes that are in the mast come out regularly, get everything replaced and put back in. And so, uh, no, it's great because it reduces compression and it takes all the load off the clutchy and makes winches available. Believe me, there's some great reasons to have locking halyards. What is a lock? A locking halyard is either externally or internally in the top of the mast. There's a bullet that goes up uh, on the halyard. It looks, looks like a big bullet. And it goes up and it goes into the mast and it locks into this, into this triggered mechanism. And what that does is it reduces all halyard stretch. So the halyard, even on a boat as big as Piwak, this massive boat, the halyard is nothing bigger than 10 millimeter, which is 3 eighths. Because all we need is enough strength to get the sail up onto the lock. And then we pull the tack down with hydraulically, which is usually a two to one, or we actually have a 12 to one tack on a code zero. I'm getting too deep in the woods here, but anyway. <laughs> um, anyway, and what it does is there's zero halyard stretch. The compression is cut in half because you don't have a halyard that goes up and down. So it relieves all the pressure on the blocks at the base of the mast. You don't have clutches trying to hold this, which they can on a boat that size. And so it's a very, very good thing to do. But when it goes sideways and you can't get a sail off lock, uh, that's a whole other problem. And uh, usually you're going right at the finish line. There's a lee shore like Kaneo. If you One year this boat couldn't get the, the sail, the kite, the spinner off lock. And we were going right towards the sandbar at Kaneo. We had to send a guy up at the last minute cut it right at the block. So uh, anyway, you don't want to get into locks on the majority of these boats that I think I'm talking to right now. Yes, sir. So furling booms, what are you talking about? Oh, okay. Uh, furling booms is the question. Furling booms, we're fans of furling booms. We are not fans of in-mass furling, okay? Big difference. We are fans of furling booms if they're constructed properly but you do, I think Ben, you'll probably agree with this if you don't put your hand up. When it's time to reef and you're going downwind, you're gonna have to turn to about 90 degrees to do it. 
Schaefer has one where the whole mass track rotates sideways. We just don't see very many of them. Uh, but it's very, it is hard to reef and you can rip a luff tape if you're not careful, if you don't turn the boat sideways to try to get the boom closer to the center line to do the reef. But the wonderful thing about in boom furling is that the mainsails are fantastic. Horizontal battens, positive roach, all of these things are very, very good. Uh, the weight of the systems is, uh, if you can, you know, you get a carbon one and it's, that's really worth it because uh, an aluminum one like Leisure Furl is extremely heavy. So with that, I am, I'll, my 10, 9.45. You have a couple more minutes. A couple more minutes, yes, sir. So it was your last uh, single-handed uh, room boat of notoriety, lost some sluts out of the mass. What's the, what's the offshore cure for that? Mm. What did he say? They both had they both had that the plastic uh, the strong track and they both had failure on that. Right. Uh, I would hope that you guys would send all your sails to the loft prior to the race to have it gone over. Uh, and then strong is it a strong track? What's the problem? That's strong track. Yeah. yeah. Gosh, we haven't seen any problems with that product. We're actually big fans of that. That was me. That was you. I saw the picture. I saw the picture. <laughs> so what did you do? No, the warning is the strong track. Yes. For probably the first eight years, it's fine. Yes, and it gets a little cracked. Yes, and it starts to crack. So the, the uh, I made the mistake of thinking it was a capital investment. Mm -hmm. Buy it once and forget it. And the reality is, maybe every 10 years, you need to replace it. Ben can back me up on this. We've seen those cracks, and we called strong track, and we said, is this a problem? Didn't they say that that is not a problem? Yeah, and we are big fans of strong track. Oh, I, I went and bought another one. Yeah, we think it's one of the better values in the marine industry. And uh, and so if anybody has any questions about it, yes, turn it on. Ceramic knives, uh, they're great, but they shatter. You know, you can't bend, you can't use them as a screwdriver, John. I mean, what? <laughs> 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 What's a screwdriver? <laughs> organic line crap, and I can't cut it with anything outside of a ceramic knife. Um, we have scissors, special scissors that will cut it for sure. And uh, uh, Ron Stan sells them. Who else sells them, Ben? The red? D Splicer sells them. There's D Splicer. There's a couple companies that sell them, but I would say between the D Splicer shear and the Vampire shear, there's a lot of other ones on the market. Some of the, you'll see some of the ones that look like just elastic orange handle shears that say they cut any material. And they yeah. So uh, the D splicers, yes, boy. Yeah, and you should have at least two pairs of those in the sale repair kit. Uh, they're great. They're about 50 bucks a pair. And, uh, but they will cut right through whatever you're trying to cut through, John, easily for about a week. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's required, I believe, in the safety, but you need to have a really sharp knife on the boom bang and one near the backstay somewhere. So if there ever is a problem, and usually that problem is around the pit or the base of the mass, bing, yeah, cut it. Yes, sir. Uh, a few lectures ago, you mentioned uh, something that you call the frizzle line. Yes. Uh, you review how that the rig is how they do. Oh, okay, frizzle line. Uh, yes. So uh, on boats like Pie Wacket, we have a frizzle line system. Whenever you do a spinnaker change, when you have one spinnaker up and you hoist another spinnaker up, your halyard will be crossed at the top of the mast. You do an inside outside change. And in the old days, and almost everybody else has to do this, the bowman would clip onto that halyard, which is crossed over the top of the secondary halyard. And we'd hoist him up and he literally crawls over the top of the spinnaker and down the other side to clear the halyard. Well, you're grinding that guy up on a halyard, which is going over another halyard. So it's it's a tough grind, and and usually it's happening, you know, in the middle of the night. And so uh, this guy uh, from Australia, 
when we were selling America's Cup back in 87, he came up with a thing and he called it the frizzle line. The halyards come out of the top of the mast. There's a little ring on each halyard that the halyard runs through. It's on a trolley system that runs uh, externally then internally. All you do is let the halyard go to the top of the mast and then you take that little ring that's at the top and you pull it back down, it clears itself. It's a next level thing. And uh, but it does work great because you don't want to be wrapping your halyards if you're doing if you're doing changes. Um, the masks have to be built kind of for it. It's uh, again, it's kind of a next level thing, but it is really cool. It, it takes a little getting used to letting a halyard go and actually hoisting it to the top of the mast <laughs> because that's just not natural. And then you get to pull it back down with this little ring down the front of the mast and it's all cleared and ready to go for your next sail change. So. It's pretty cool. Yes. One, more, one, one more question? One more. Is it like a camera recommendation on what things to cut with live rigging that you need to? Uh, yeah, don't cut the rod. Uh, rod right. is hard. That's a Nitronic 50 rod. The turnbuckle studs are bronze. They're soft. So you can get right on through those. Uh, we dropped a rig at Fastnet Rock a few years ago, and uh, we had put uh, brass or bronze. There were bronze uh, cotter pins in all the clevis pins in the rig. And yeah, we dropped the rig at Fastnet Rock in the middle of the night. And all we had was a big hammer and we just hit the clevis pins and it just sheared off the bronze cotter pins and we got rid of that rig in about five minutes. Uh, but anyway, don't cut rod. Uh, uh, just another thing safety wise, because it's part of what I do. Um, it, you're going to have a hacksaw tape the extra blades to the hacksaw frame. Don't get blades from Home Depot, get blades from a, a online, you know, badass hacksaw blade store and then tape them to the frame because usually if you've got to get rid of a mast, you, you're getting pitched all over the place because once the rig goes down, then the boat really becomes unruly. And so if you're trying to cut something and you get hit by a wave or you roll, you'll break a blade. And if you have to go try to find another blade down below in the toolbox, don't do that. Tape a stack of blades one at a time onto the frame. So if you need another blade, you just unwrap that piece of tape and there one blade comes out and the other ones are still held in place. So just the kind of stuff. Yeah, God, I wish I could spend the all day with you guys, but excuse me? This sounds like fun. Oh, great. Yeah. Yeah, it's just great. All kinds of great tips, Scott. Thank you. Thank you very much. For no the problem. Okay, thank you.